Hello and um, welcome to the e-lecture 9 uh, for the EGM 37 additive manufacturing course. Um, we're going to continue here with the chapter on process control uh, and additive manufacturing defects. So this is the second part following on from uh, lecture 8. What we're going to talk about are some of the main additive manufacturing defects which are common. Uh, you've heard me talk about these uh, throughout the module so far. Uh, so we're mainly going to focus on porosity, residual stress, geometrical shrinkage and others. And we're going to look at the effects uh, of these defects on the uh, properties of the materials. We'll go through each of these in, in sequence, porosity, residual stress, geometrical defects, delamination, surface roughness. And this is about how we control these defects with the machines. And um, we're going to talk a little bit about process control maps power, laser power, uh, laser speed. So the main additive manufacturing defects are porosity, residual stress, geometrical shrinkage, delamination of layers, toppling, sinking or creeping of certain areas due to the build. We also have quite levels of high levels of surface roughness um, due to the high cooling rates. And of course, we're talking um, about uh, a digital uh, building. So we're going to talk about step geometries and the relationship between the uh, discrete nature of the layer thickness and its effect upon uh, surface roughness and upon the geometry of the parts. So none of these defects, we're going to focus on them here to talk about the uh, additive manufacturing process. Specifically, we're going to concentrate on um, the powder bed laser uh, system, powder fusion, um, but they are no real worse uh, than um, in any other uh, sort of manufacturing processes. Uh, so you get porosity in casting, uh, you get shrinkage in casting, uh, you get residual stresses in, in, in casting, uh, so the, and, and, and surface roughness as well. So all of these do occur in other uh, processes, powder-based, melting-based, uh, but they do uh, they're no inherently worse in additive, but they just need to be considered as part of uh, uh, the, the build. Now, what happens though, the defects do uh, have a um, relationship with the properties of the uh, as-built component. Uh, and this can sometimes make the material properties significantly different to what you might expect from that material. Um, so uh, you can see this with uh, uh, the kind of uh, defects that you might find. So you have a variable surface roughness. Uh, areas which are hard to reach will be difficult to polish, so therefore you have to take these things into account. Um, the, uh, the, the, the occurrence of the porosity and also the cooling uh, that you get uh, with an additive part leads to sometimes non-isotropic material properties. So you could, and these will be manifested in the elasticity, so you could potentially have a young modulus which is higher in one direction than the other. So going through the layers, uh, you might have, uh, and you typically see that the uh, tensile strength uh, in the vertical direction through the layers uh, is uh, lower and uh, the tensile strength uh, going uh, along the layers. So this can lead to a wider scatter, scatter of the properties. So you might have a variance on the, uh, on the upper, on the yield strength, which is uh, measured. Um, and this is something which for critical applications is very important. So uh, for uh, an air engine, for example, uh, there are very strict rules on the levels of scatter which you might get from um, tensile tests. Um, properties such as uh, porosity or any inclusions uh, will, will affect the uh, fatigue strength and creep life. And then again, this is something which has to be factored in to the, uh, to the build. Uh, other properties which get affected would be the high temperature strength and uh, corrosion resistance. Um, 
A lot of these are driven by microstructural and compositional, potentially compositional differences to what you might expect. So um, we've talked a little bit about uh, the fact that coming through from powder, you might have higher levels of oxygen already in the powder, uh, which by the time uh, that uh, higher, those higher levels of oxygen are uh, in, encapsulated into the final build, you might end up with levels of oxygen which are too high uh, to meet the accepted uh, application. Okay, so uh, again, these defects are nothing that you would not consider in almost all manufacturing processes. So whether you were working uh, to develop a cast turbine blade uh, or you're working to develop a uh, additively manufactured turbine blade, uh, in both instances, you would have to take into account uh, through as you developed your TRL levels, take it from one TRL to another, you would have to consider all aspects of the properties of that blade. Whether it be casting or pressed or isostatically pressed or indeed additively made, uh, all of these things need to take into account. So it's not just additive, but these are things that we were going to talk about. So what is porosity? Okay, Can porosity occur for a variety of different reasons? Yes. How does it occur in additive manufacturing? Well, there are various uh, reasons. In the last lecture, we had a quick look at the um, uh, the way in which we design experiments. Uh, so, uh, if you have insufficient uh, power, uh, power density, i.e., you have a low power and a high speed, you may not be potentially covering the entire area of the build plate. Uh, so, you could have uh, porosity occurring because of insufficient coverage of the base plate or uh, indeed as you uh, go up in your power density you might be uh, introducing uh, the uh, balling or you might in be introducing uh, keyhole melting which itself can lead to additive porosity so porosity is the potentially driven by the incomplete coverage so itself it'll be a void the void could be full of gas or it could be uh, a shrinkage porosity and there may potentially be no gas in there it could be just a vacuum but in either way what you have is an incomplete um, uh, volume in which there is no material um, so we're going to talk a little bit about how a porosity comes out in SLM parts and uh, how we control it. And SLM here, sorry, I mean powder bed fusion, uh, how can it can be controlled. And indeed, we'll talk a little bit about the acceptable levels of porosity in some applications. OK, so if going uh, looking at a process, a process map, a process map is typically uh, the combination of a series of experiments with different laser powers, and different scan speeds. That is a very typical. So what we have mapped on here is the potential of porosity as a function of uh, laser power and uh, scan speeds. So uh, what you'll notice this is quite from an old paper. Uh, so the laser powers at 100 watts are significantly lower than most of the powers that uh, are used nowadays, and also the scan speeds are very much lower than what would happen. Uh, at, at, at the current state of the art, where we're talking 200 to 400 to 500, or even up to 1,000 watts. And the scan speeds will be anywhere up to um, 1,000 or 3,000 millimeters per second. But the, uh, the same principle, principle um, applies, um, and we did have a quick look at, power, at um, process maps last time. So you can see where uh, you've got interconnected porosity, uh, where we've really had almost no fusion of the material with the higher scan speeds and the low, very low power. It hasn't really touched the powder, it hasn't really melted it, so therefore it's full of pores. Um, you've got an area where we have got a low enough speed and a high enough power, and you get uh, lots of dents. Uh, uh, it's pretty much fully dense. Um, there you could define dense as anywhere between 80 and 99.9% terms of the relative density. Then you have an area uh, in, in between where you have uh, more porosity and less porosity. The hatch spacing uh, versus scan speed uh, there. Um, so 
We talked about the overlap, which is uh, which comes from having the lines being generated further off. You can have intersection. So here we're looking at the porosity from this paper by Vanderbroek uh, from 2007, and they show pretty typical results. So as they increase the scan speed uh, for a given hatch spacing, uh, you end up with more uh, inter uh, porosity. Uh, in between the, uh, the hatch spacing. And the larger the hatch spacing, of course, you also get increased porosity. So uh, what's pointed out here as well is what, you, if you remember correctly, in the uh, seminar that earlier this week, we actually calculated the, uh, the power density in terms of uh, joules per cubic millimeter. And that gives you some uh, high, uh, relatively high uh, power densities there. So we can also look at... Uh, the, uh, the hatch pattern itself. Uh, so you have different strategies may uh, induce different levels of porosity. Um, so this is just from a different paper. It just shows the kind of experiment that you would do with the machine uh, and the measurement of the porosity. We saw this as well last time. So this is what you guys uh, calculated. Uh, you can, when you do a, a, uh, an experimentation to set out the material parameters on the machine that for a, for a given powder, uh, you have various uh, machine settings that you would want to play with. Uh, you can play with the point distance uh, and vary that between lower and upper limits, maybe 25 to 105 microns. And if you remember, the uh, the point distance uh, we said was uh, this distance D1. So for this is very typical for a Renishaw machine. We pointed out the differences between uh, a, the Renishaw, which runs a modulated laser, there's a series of spot uh, wells which are connected or by the point distance between them and, the, and the, the amount of time that the laser is exposed to in each of those. And this should be, and that, those two things together, so the point distance and the exposure time, give you a line speed in that direction. For a continuous laser, uh, the laser would be switched on all the time and the uh, line speed would literally be the, the speed that the laser traverses a line before it comes back. You can see that this particular uh, hatch pattern that we have here has what they call a meander, uh, a, a meander hatch pattern, so that the, the laser comes down one side, hits the contour boundary, and then comes back in the opposite direction and weaves its way and meanders its way back and forward across the entire um, area. So, those two parameters, the point distance and the exposure time, act in a one in the line direction of the laser. And then what we have is this distance d3, uh, which is the hatch spacing. Okay. Um, and then we have other parameters that we can play with. We can have, play with the actual laser power. Uh, of course, that's all in two dimensions uh, on the surface of the plate. And then in three dimensions, then we can also play with the levels of the layer thickness. OK, um, so for a particular study, we might want to vary two of these parameters, the point distance and the exposure time, but keep these constant just to see what the effect is of the uh, laser speed at a fixed laser power. And as you calculated uh, in the seminar last week, and I showed you how to do this, we can work out uh, the uh, the volume laser energy there, which is in joules per millimeters cubed. And this is a design of experiments whereby we vary the point distance in discrete steps, so 25, 65, and 105 micron, and we vary the exposure time in 17 microseconds, 110 microseconds, 150 microseconds. And that gives us uh, this volume laser energy input, which is a calculated value, that is not identical to the amount of energy that actually goes into the cubes because we are not taking into account reflected energy and energy lost through thermal losses. Okay, so it is just a way of indexing these um, uh, machine parameters. What we can also see here is that each of these experiments is repeated three times. So for any particular combination of point distance and exposure time, we have three cubes, 
okay? And this is to be able to do, when you do the experiment to measure density, you can take an average of the three. It gives you um, some idea of the variance between uh, the measurements. We also saw last time, and this is a repetition, so for that very same uh, um, uh, design of experiments that we had there, uh, we can see how with the lower laser energy input here, we have C12. These are the average of three measurements, and it shows us that again, uh, what we can also see from the uh, micrograph below is that the the hatch pattern that we've selected with those parameters yeah, for the uh, point distance and the exposure time leads to a high level of porosity. In fact, it's almost a 40% uh, level of porosity. And you can see very clearly the lines here uh, in which uh, the laser has moved back and forward. And, and between those lines, you can see that the, the laser coverage has left and has not been complete and we have a lot of porosity. So as we go up in our laser uh, energy density, we go to the next stage, B13. And B13, we're now talking about 13%. And you can see that while there is still very clear tracks left where the laser has gone back and forth and there's porosity uh, at some of the uh, along the intersections, so it's not being a great uh, it's not great. It, it is significantly better than what we saw uh, with the lower laser energy input and so on. And as we increase it, we see that here there's a peak on B23 and then A12 in which there is a change in the type of porosity. With B213, B23 here, we have still some evidence of the uh, laser lines and porosity in between those tracks. Uh, and then somewhere between B23 and A12, in this peak of the density curve, we see that the, the porosity, the form of the porosity has changed. And at that point, we start to introduce with the light, higher laser energy input, we start to see uh, that we have this more globular um, a form of the porosity, which increases with the increased laser energy input. So that that shows that we we can have too little in, uh, laser energy going into it, or we can have too much, and we need to optimize those. And we will pick out the properties which give us the optimal um, uh, density there. So this just shows you closer up some of those um, some of those uh, micrographs. So you can see the the dark bit here uh, is the the porosity. You can see evidence here of unmelted powder particles in between the pores, and some of them semi sintered to the side. Um, so obviously this is not a part which would be in any way structural. I consider it structural. It has a forty percent porosity. Uh, here we have 11% porosity or 89% relative density. So again, it's a little bit better, but we can still see quite large pores here, almost of the order of 100, 120 microns. And these are, you can clearly see that the tracks and you can still see some evidence of, if you look closely, you can see in, in some of these gaps, you can see, uh, powder particles which have not been melted. As we go up, getting towards the optimal, you can still, you start to, you can no longer really see the laser track so well, but you still have some quite large uh, evidence there. So here we're down to a 2% porosity or 98% relative density, and that's made up from these small pores here. Our Optimal in this particular run was a 1% porosity or 99% relative density. And you can see at this stage that we have only a few smaller pores, more of the size of 20 to 30 microns max uh, there. Um, and you can't see any real evidence of the laser tracks themselves. But as we keep on increasing 
the laser energy density here to 170, we can see that the porosity starts to get bigger. It has a very different shape to before, globular, there. So these type of uh, experiments are done uh, just to show that we're not the only ones uh, well, we're on those results that get. Uh, here we can see the uh, scan speed here and uh, density. And you can see that as you lower the scan speed, what you do have is a relative say, uh, densities in the region of uh, 12, uh, 88 to 100. So therefore, uh, with this, we have the density rho, yeah, relative density rho equals 100 percent minus the porosity. Okay, so as the porosity goes up to 10%, uh, your density would go down to 90%. That's the relationship between porosity and relative density. And you can see that even here, with, with even with higher, la um, higher laser powers, that we have a peak point and speed at which our highest density occurs. And here, even more clearly, we can see uh, for uh, 316, you can see this very clear optimal location as you change your uh, scan speed versus power. You can see these optimal locations here, these peaks in which the uh, laser density is the best. OK. Uh, so exposure time and point distance, line speed. Is one thing that we can do. Uh, then we can also do experiments where we vary the power and the exposure time. Uh, so this is uh, sort of top down on some of the laser tracks. So you can see that uh, we've varied uh, the power of the laser 100, 150, 200 watts. And then here we've uh, varied the exposure time for a short exposure time and a longer exposure time. So with the low power, short exposure time here, you can almost see the individual spots of the laser. And what you can see is between the tracks here, along this distance, so the laser's coming down here, coming back, and along here you can see that there is uh, some unmelted powder, and the tracks are not overlapping each other. As we increase the power, yeah, you can see that now you can still sort of see the, the, uh, the, the way in which the, um, the lasers moved and you can see the individual spots, but you can see that there's a lot more smearing, the, the melt pool has moved out, but there is still uh, some gap here between the two. So finally, when we end up at the highest uh, power, uh, uh, you can see that now we're almost closing the, uh, in, well, we pretty much closed the gap uh, entirely between the laser coming this way, and then the laser going back this way, and you can see that the tracks are almost closed. So same thing happening with a higher exposure time, it just happens quicker and the melt pools are much wider. So now at this stage, you're getting almost like a full remelting uh, between the tracks. So in this location uh, here, for this particular hatch spacing, uh, we're getting a lot of remelting uh, from the laser as it goes on, over top of each other. So this is another set of uh, sort of uh, design of uh, experiments that we've done with uh, this time varying the power and the exposure. So that type of experiment gets repeated um, with uh, all the different machine settings. And um, you can see here from a paper by Gu and Chen, uh, sort of uh, a very typical process map with more typical laser powers, which are uh, applicable now. Um, you'll vary the scan speed in that direction, so from lower to higher, and you'll vary the laser power from lower to higher in that direction. And you'll typically have areas uh, divided up on the map where you get uh, no uh, no melting, no good, track one without consolidation. Uh, then you might have an area three here, for example, where you have tracks with small side balls, you get a lot of balling, uh, you may have cracks on the tracks. Uh, then you'll have uh, two here, tracks with uh, significantly coarsened balls, and then you'll have continuous smooth tracks in this sort of green area. So where you want to be able to be with the machine, to run this as high a scan speed as possible with as low a laser power as possible, but remaining in the green zone. So 
just to show that the process behind the, the 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 work behind putting on process maps acts across all types of different machines so this is very common uh, we have uh, here another paper by Hauser from 2004 and this time they're using a co2 laser on steels and they they look at the uh, not just looking down on top of the tracks to look at the continuity, but they also cross section the tracks through the center, and they look at the shape of the bead which is formed. Okay, and with that they build up a series of different process maps, still varying the power and the laser speed. So you see here it's been done for a different number of steels. You've got 314 stainless steel, you've got an H13 tool steel, and an M2 Mirage steel there. And you can see that uh, although uh, there are differences uh, between the different materials uh, with those particular laser settings, that generally you have that division of the process map into uh, the different areas so where you don't want to be is where it doesn't really form or where it balls up which is no good there you want to be in this sort of area not obviously uh, you don't want to have too low a uh, scan speed where you start to get the, uh, the, the the cap of the melt bead has been blown off so typically that area B there is probably the optimal area that you'd want to have in terms of the appropriate scan speed and the appropriate power. So here, from the same paper as well, uh, also using a CO2, CO2 laser with steel power powder. Uh, this this shows specifically uh, for uh, the M2 miraging steel, uh, and it shows for uh, the H13 tool steel. Uh, we can see very similar sort of process maps uh, and the division of these into uh, those different areas we're talking about are unconsolidated. Uh, some uh, very fine tracks. D is where you get a lot of breakup of the tracks. So you get C, you've got more continuous and, and, and optimal type tracks. And B, you start to build. And so in this sort of area between B and C is where you would probably want to be. And then A, where you've just blown the cap off the top of the bead. And that's uh, too high, too high an energy density. <sighs> okay, and just to show you that this is just not just for steels; they're using and uh, CO2 lasers. Or this is an ND YAG laser with a titanium alloy. And again, uh, here they're building up a process map, uh, which also has those similar divisions of. Uh, the uh, probe of areas in which uh, you don't have uh, any melting or you have poor melt tracks. And then... Okay, so what we've seen is process maps. Uh, and here are three different examples, which are basically showing the same things, but in different ways. Uh, so I like this one here the best in terms of the explanations uh, so what we have is if we work our way up here from the uh, low energy density so therefore high scan speed low power right um, you can see that F here is a zone where we didn't have enough power uh, density to actually melt the powder uh, we did form some tracks in this area but they were extremely fragile in E so then in D they were they were a bit more regular, but they were often broken up from uh, balling. C there was still some uh, occasionally broken up tracks, but it was getting better. So B is the best area to be in here, where you managed to get continuous tracks, yeah, and they were actually uh, fused to the powder bed. Uh, but then here A we had uh, a flat a flat bead, which was maybe slightly broken up. And that's not such a good area to be in. Okay, so um, just to highlight what we were talking about in terms of the uh, longitudinal. So if you look down on top of the tracks, and then you look, you cross section through the tracks themselves. So you look at the profile. We look at it from the top, and this shows you that this location B is where we really want to be, where we have this slightly rounded cap and some penetration, but not 
a massive amount of penetration into the lower bed. So we talked about last time the uh, two two different areas that we on those process maps where we wanted to avoid. One was balling, which was driven uh, by uh, liquid metal surface tension effects, and the other one was uh, the other effect that we wanted to avoid was keyholing. So here's a paper by Gong on uh, titan titanium 64 alloy, where they varied the speed of the laser in that direction, and they've varied the power of the laser in that direction. And you can clearly see here that as we increase the laser power at low speeds, we get this area here where we have that traditional and classic uh, keyhole type penetration, which I described last time, but we're going to go into a little bit more detail now. That keyhole penetration uh, creates uh, additional porosity. So this is your high energy density. Yeah, it's moving slowly, high power, therefore high energy density. Uh, and then uh, on the other extreme up here, when you've got low power and high velocity, you have this the bead up situation where you're getting uh, balling and your, your tracks break up. And in fact, even at the lowest powers here, you've probably may not even achieved uh, a melt. So uh, there's a lot of work going into at the moment, and this is currently very much uh, state of the art, is determining when a particular uh, uh, material powder and laser combination will transition from the conductive mode of melt uh, through to the keyhole mode of melt. And now we define the uh, the, the transition period. So if you're above, if the depth of your, uh, so if this is your uh, bead, if you have uh, the laser coming down and you have this classical sort of elliptical, if your width here of the melt, and then you've got your depth this way, once the ratio between the depth the width of your um, melt pool and the bead goes above one, then you can say that you've transitioned through to keyhole. There's a lot of work going on in, in, in determining the exact, trying to determine exactly when that happens. And uh, here are some more papers to look up, you know, some uh, papers from people working in Cranfield there with larger lasers, and then people working at Lawrence Livermore uh, Wayne King there uh, working uh, with uh, sort of uh, smaller lasers, uh, powder bed style sort of smaller lasers. So overall, uh, when you look at a process map, uh, you see uh, that there are areas we want to avoid. These areas of high uh, power density of the laser, so high power, low speed, you get Keyholing here, we want to avoid that to avoid porosity. Uh, we obviously want to avoid all of this area here where we've got low power, high speed, because we don't, we may not even get tracks. But then we also want to avoid the regions in this region here, which is unstable uh, because balling forms along the track, and we have. Uh, it's this region here that we want to be in to get the continuous uh, tracks. So I've got an example here of uh, example number one, where we have a fiber laser focused on mild steel, and we given that the power power density PD is given by uh, P over A in megawatts per centimeter squared, where A is pi R squared, the area of the laser beam, and R is the radius of the beam. We have an interaction time of T equals R over 2U, where U is the speed of the laser. Can we work out from figure five which, which mode the melting or the weld is in where the laser power is 1000 watts, T equals 2R equals 0 0.04 with a speed of 0, a scan speed of 4 centimeters per second, 4000 watts, T equals 2R, 0.15 centimeters and a scan speed of 15 centimeters per second, and then a laser power of 2000 watts equals 2R, 0.2 centimeters, and a scan speed of 20 centimeters per second. 
So note that this figure, which comes from the paper from Cranfield, the Ascent Sauer, is for the interaction time of 10 milliseconds. So we need to check that the velocities of the laser are appropriate for this interaction time. Okay, so uh, you can do that and you can see that the interaction time does correspond. Then we need to calculate the area of the beam and then calculate the power density in megawatts per centimeter squared using P in the previous equation 9.1. So the laser power at 1000 watts with D was 2R and the scan speed of 2 centimeters per second is 0.8 megawatts per centimeter squared. So if we go to 0.8, which would be here, you'll see that that would take us probably into this region up here and therefore it's the the uh, penetrate the, the the laser will be in keyhole mode okay for a laser power of 4000 watts at a scan speed of 15 centimeters per second okay uh, we have a power density of 0.23 so if we go to 0.23 that's there we're going to be in the transition mode and for a laser power of 2000 watts with d equals 0.2 centimeters the scan speed of 20 centimeters per second gives us that the power density is 0.06 which is about there on the graph so therefore in that case we would probably be in a conduction mode keyhole okay so I'm going to keep skip this example and we'll run through this example in class later on um, this is just another way of working out the uh, transition but for a powder bed system so we'll skip that and there is a uh, video on YouTube which you can have a look at uh, there uh, if you're interested in those transitions between uh, conductive and keyhole mode melting. So that those are aspects which lead to porosity. Uh, there's quite a bit there. What we're going to look at now is residual stress. Okay, so residual stresses are introduced during the process, uh, and uh, which can be, they can be mechanically thermal plating and machining and they come in all different processes they're not always a bad thing but uh, so you can have it if you want to you can introduce some residual stress if you want to have a uh, compressive surface stress yeah to make it harder um, so yes there are different types of residual stress flow induced residual stress and thermal residual stresses due to shrinkage during solidification which is typical of catalytic casting yeah so basically residual stresses are stresses that remain inside the material when it has reached equilibrium with its environment okay and they can be classified according to length scale according to type 1 residual stress which vary over large distances namely the whole dimensional part the macro stresses and type 2 and type 3 residual stresses which occur at a different uh, because of the different phases of the material due to dislocations right down to the atomic scale So temperature, the mechanism by which uh, uh, residual stress is created. So uh, we have it during the heating, since the top layer is restricted in some way. Yeah, elasticity eventually plastic compression on the top layer occurs, and it doesn't have to go into melting for that to happen. So we can have residual stresses, we can have a plastic deformation without it actually being melting. Now when it actually melts and you get a uh, contraction, there, where the melting takes part, the melting takes place, you can get a tensile uh, stress, which is added in the layer. Okay, and then a compress that leads to a compressive stress in the lower layers, and these are additive. Okay, so um, as you go up through the layers, you end up introducing more and more and more stress into the material. Okay, so lots of different ways of measuring stress. You can drill a hole, a hole, and this is the, the a simple but destructive method of doing it. But you can go all the way up to X-ray diffraction and neutron diffraction, which are non-destructive ways of doing it. 
and you can also use ultrasonic and magnet magnetic methods. I mentioned earlier that the residual stress was uh, was uh, itself in increasing on a layer by layer basis, um, and there comes a point where if your layers are thick enough, you will end up uh, having a crack during the part. Okay, so that was a quick introduction to residual stresses and the occurrence and why they happen. Uh, we also have, uh, we would have said we were going to talk about stepped geometries. So uh, what do we mean by stepped geometries? Well, because the layer thickness is discrete, it means that if we have a curved surface, which we're trying to approximate in the vertical direction, it means that in order to get a better approximation of that curve, we need to reduce the layer thickness. And we can only do that so far. So the machines are restricted to down to maybe a 20 micron layer thickness. The powder sizes that you use mean that it is often no point in going smaller than a 20 micron because your powder size distributions are larger than 20 micron. Okay, so we are, that means that we are always going to have some form of surface roughness, uh, uh, which is driven by the discrete nature of the, the method. This has therefore an influence on the RA or the surface roughness measurement, yeah? and it kind of it does go part of the way uh, towards explaining the higher surface roughnesses that you would find on an additive machine than on others. So you can see here through the angle at which uh, the uh, you 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 build. Uh, so if your if your surface is inclined uh, at above or below 45 degrees. Uh, you can see how the actual uh, levels of surface roughness increase. So there is actually a, uh, the staircase effect is chronicled by Yasser and Kruth in this paper here, and it's shown there. <coughs> I should point out in that last bit on the uh, surface roughness by uh, step geometries that um, the, the powder uh, itself, it will also add to the surface roughness of the part. So unless you polish or sandblast the, the semi-sintered powder onto the side, that will affect your readings. So here are some of the uh, uh, some of the effects that happen through to through from shrinking because we are dealing with a, a liquid metal before it solidifies and you can get delamination of the layers uh, where there's not been sufficiently good uh, penetration of the laser into the previous layer uh, which when combined with the uh, with the shrinkage uh, will end up uh, with these delamination. Okay, so how do we control the defects? Getting, uh, well, we want to be able to control the porosity, the residual stress, the shrinkage, surface roughness and stepping. All of these things, we need to understand how they happen. And then we need to optimize the machine settings to reduce these. And then of course we have trade-offs to make during the build. How long do we want the build? How strong do we need our parts? What do we need to allow for post treatments, for the heat treatment, for the for the hipping? What, what is the machining? What are allowed? So in some of these cases, we can use higher laser powers, and lower laser speeds. Uh, we can use heated base plates to control to a certain extent the residual stress. We can play with support structures and build positions to minimize uh, residual stress and uh, give us a better chance of success in a build. We can play with hatch patterns themselves, and that itself has some influence on both porosity and residual stress. Uh, we can use uh, alternative offset for melting strategies, tight control on powder feedstock size. This is very important, very topical. So uh, we might have a very sharp powder size distribution. We can to control the stepping, we want to decrease our layer thickness, but then we'll have to change our powder feedstock. Yeah, we control cooling rates using alternative scanning strategies. And this again is about the control of uh, both porosity and residual stress. The wiper speed control and powder packing. We want to vary the powder feed rates and flooding. Position of the build on the base plate, heat treatment afterwards rescanning and polishing all of these things are way in which we can control these things so here's just to show you some of the effect of heating the base plate so through heating the base plate uh, we can if you look at this paper here 
from uh, Kempen from 2013. Uh, you can see that for uh, a, 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 a heated base plate here um, uh, and a remelting strategy, those three things combined allows us to get higher relative densities. Uh, just itself by heating the base plate allows us to get significantly higher uh, uh, re re uh, relative densities. Here they've heated the base plate up to 200. In our machines, we're restricted between 140 and 170 degrees. But yes, it shows that there is an influence. Yeah, and again, this is highlights the uh, the increases uh, in density through preheating the plate. But it has effects on the on the uh, properties as well. What they're showing here is that so you can see that the surface roughness goes down and the hardness uh, goes up. And we can also show that the residual stresses also drop uh, slightly, not as much as you might hope. To really have a significant effect on surface stress, you would be needing to heat up about 600 degrees. But this would lead to all sorts of problems with the sintering of the powder. Hot static pressing is a post uh, uh, heating uh, and, and pressing uh, heat treatment that can be done to close porosity. So what we can see here is a before and after. So if you remember from our the original design of experiments, we had a sample C12, uh, which had a very high 40% porosity. And if you hit that, you can see that it's closed it down and it'll take it as much as take away as much as 20% of that porosity is taken away in the hipping stage. And that continues to happen even with a, uh, a less porous sample, the hipping treatment <coughs> will reduce the porosity. So that's just so that all samples are improved in terms of the porosity. And in fact, uh, these samples here on the left, which are the higher energy densities, show that the porosity, that rounded porosity that occurs at the higher energy density, is actually easier to close. And these samples here are 99.9% .9 uh, solid. But having said that, uh, well, we can see here uh, the, the actual curves of density as the uh, input laser power, uh, the uh, power density goes up uh, with a hit and non hit. So the as built cubes is uh, the lower curve where we have that peak. But here we see that uh, we've uh, managed to uh, reduce the porosity by doing a hipping step. But it doesn't remove, hipping might get rid of porosity but it doesn't always improve all the parameters as much as you might like. So although you go, you, you improve the density, you still end up with a slightly lower uh, elasticity modulus, for example, here at the high energy densities. So, uh, and also just to show that it's not uh, always, uh, that the hipping itself can, uh, will change the microstructures and get rid of the porosity, but uh, it does lead to what they call asensitization, which is something which might worsen your corrosion resistance. Right, I'm going to uh, finish there really. All of these uh, examples from this point onwards are about uh, different ways, different uh, geometries which are set up as to try to standardize the, the testing of the samples, which allows you to uh, uh, work out uh, whether you're re reducing your porosity, for example. So this is what is a, a standard density test here. Uh, components where we're looking here to measure surface roughness on different faces. Uh, components where we're looking for geometrical uh, 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 problems based upon the shrinkage. So all of these standard uh, components would be things that would go on the base plate. Uh, obviously, we have tensile test bars and fatigue bars. Uh, and uh, sort of uh, components which you use for hardness. There's one that we use for a, ver a variety of different tests, uh, from surface on that, uh, surface roughness, uh, we can do density, we can do directional accuracy of holes. Uh, so, and they would all go onto one single benchmark plate for a given powder, and then we would do all those, run all those measurement tests to see how they do.
Here's a picture of uh, another set of tests that were developed in the Amaze project. Uh, here's some that we do ourselves. And here are some benchmarks which are uh, meant to be going into the ASTM 42 standards for a variety of uh, um, physical properties and geometrical tolerances of the build. And it's this sort of uh, component which allows you to build up standards so that all machines can say whether they pass those standards or not. Here's a typical surface roughness where you're looking at the orientation of different faces. Right, okay, so that is uh, finally the end of uh, e-lecture nine. There's gonna be a test on Blackboard, not this week, we'll do this next week, where I'll be asking you uh, about some of the uh, contents of this lecture. We'll also run through it in the seminar in a more condensed form and maybe do a quick test. So all the best for now, talk to you soon and see you in the next lecture.